The Middle Ages were a time hostile to women, the church despised and distrusted them. Their only duty was to remain submissive to their father and then to their husband. Whether they were queens, abbesses or women of the people, women had little to no power over society. The Middle Ages sucked, they aren't called the Dark Ages for nothing. The absence of many things we have today such as medicine, antibiotics, laws, technology, even running water would be quite a turn off for most of us. The Middle Ages, or medieval period, lasted from the 5th century to the late 15th century, between the fall of the Roman Empire and the beginning of the Renaissance. Welcome back to History Rediscovered. In today's episode, we discuss the sad life of women in medieval times. Furthermore, we discuss the disgusting things they went through. Early Marriages A girl especially of nobility in the Middle Ages would have been married off as soon as she was old enough to start bearing children usually at the age of 12. Marriages were meant to preserve wealth, produce an heir, prevent wars and form strategic alliances. Childbearing was of course considered the main and only purpose of women in general and those too poor to have servants also had to raise and care for the children they had. They were expected to spend much of her early adulthood pregnant. Noble girls were married as early as 12 to 17 years. For example, Saint Bridget of Sweden, the founder of the Brigitina's nuns and monks married when she was 13. Margaret of York, Edward IV's sister, was considered alarmingly old when she was still single at 19, therefore was looked down on. Henry III's wife Eleanor was only 16 when she gave birth to the future Edward I. Henry I's daughter Matilda married at 12, a very young age, her father arranged for her to marry Roman Emperor. 15-year-old Catherine of Aragon wed Henry's older brother, Arthur. They married in splendid pomp at St. Paul's in November 1501. There are very few records for those not of the nobility, at least until the later medieval. But this was the same fate for most women. It was very important and mandatory that a noblewoman is a virgin at marriage out of purely pragmatical reasons. Once married she would be treated according to her husband's demands. This was the way of the world at that time. He could be kind and sweet or cruel, wicked and thoughtless, it was all his choice. You can simply imagine what women who wed cruel men went through. Infant mortality was exceedingly common, so you had to have as many children as your body would allow to increase the odds that at least one or two would survive to adulthood. When they recovered from childbirth, women were responsible for keeping their homes livable, which was a full-time job. Letting a fire go out could be a death sentence, since they were pretty difficult to start back before matches and zippos, not to mention the fact that paper was incredibly expensive and scarce, so you couldn't use it for kindling. Royal women often found themselves entangled in the alliances in which they were pawns. The more assertive ones might have exercised power along the way. The noble women who didn't marry at all, for example, if their parents couldn't afford their dowry, would be sent or oblated to a convent to lessen the shame. Women in the Middle Ages tended to have fewer periods due to the frequency of childbearing. You and I can both agree that giving birth comes with excruciating pain. You can just imagine how difficult it was for women at that time giving birth almost every year. Today, with the benefits of fetal monitoring ultrasound scans and epidurals, the risk for mother and baby during pregnancy and childbirth is at an all-time low. However, during the medieval period, giving birth was incredibly dangerous. Breach presentations of the baby during labor often proved fatal for both mother and child. Labor could go on for several days, even weeks and some women eventually died of exhaustion and pain. While caserine sections were known, they were unusual other than when the mother of the baby was already dead or dying, and they were not necessarily successful. Midwives, rather than trained doctors, usually attended pregnant women. They helped the mother to be during labor and, if needed, were able to perform emergency baptisms on babies in danger of dying. Most had received no formal training, but relied on practical experience gleaned from years of delivering babies. New mothers might survive the labor, but could die from various postnatal infections and complications. Equipment was very basic, and manual intervention was common. Status was no barrier to these problems. Even Jane Seymour, the third wife of Henry VIII, 
died soon after giving birth to the future Edward VI in 1537. The Middle Ages in Europe witnessed a universal paradox of tolerance and condemnation with regards to prostitution. In early medieval France, for example, night workers faced public humiliation in an attempt to repress the trade. More disturbingly, there were those women who were sold by their family members in order to generate funds for the family. Others did it willingly to support their needs. Night workers in those times regularly got pregnant due to lack of preventative measures, most of them threw the babies because nobody wanted to raise babies in that environment. There are some archaeological sites of brothels where almost all baby graves contained male children, suggesting that in some places they did actually raise the girls. Many people saw STIs as punishment for immoral acts. Mostly night workers and adulterers contracted the infection. It's hard to tell how many STDs existed, the most common during the Middle Ages was gonorrhea and it was usually found in women. It has been documented since the Greco-Roman times. It causes sterility, blindness in infants born to infected mothers and discharge of pus. What's unfortunate is that people in those times did not know how to properly diagnose such diseases. They treated STDs in many different ways, and because they didn't have any idea about bacteria, all of those treatment methods were mostly not effective often did more harm than good, they used a lot of mercury which is quite poisonous in treating STDs, with people rubbing the chemical right on their skin, sometimes they injected it into the females. Leeching and hitting one's genitals with a heavy object were often proposed as treatments as well. Women were seen as weaker and inferior to men therefore were not treated with respect, rather humiliated especially when it came to STIs. Women were more likely to be mentioned as carriers of disease and could be banished from stews. Men who contracted the disease blamed it on women. The removal of a woman's nose and ears was a punishment for adulterous women. By disfiguring a woman's face, their aim was to make sure she remained undesirable, so no man can look at her since her beauty was eliminated. On the other hand, an adulterous man was simply made to pay a fine or simply pardoned. Woman accused of sleeping around might be also be locked into a drunkard's cloak. A punishment known as the walk of shame was common as well, a traditional punishment for holotry or being a termagnet and overbearing wife. Women were made to walk barefoot through the whole city, sometimes dressed only in their petticoat. The streets had rough and sharp stones, large crowds lined up to stare and laugh, banging basins and pans, would accompany the procession, adding to the woman's humiliation. The accused might be dragged from their bed at night and paraded through the town with the crowd shouting and spitting on the victim. Medieval cosmetic were made with such substances hazardous to health, contributing greatly to the early death of women who made frequent use. One such example is Queen Elizabeth I, she used what was known as the Venetian ceruse, a mixture of vinegar and lead, a potential killer. It was fashionable to look very pale at that time also appealing to men. Most ladies slathered the Venetian ceruse across the face, neck and décolletage. The main problem with this makeup was due to the large lead ingredient and, if used over an extended period of time, caused illness and death. Make it worse, the white makeup was left on the skin for a very long time without being washed. If the makeup didn't kill you or make you ill, it would make your skin appear gray and wrinkled once the makeup was removed. Ladies left it on their face for at least a week before cleaning themselves. 